without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Jennifer Perry is an assistant professor of anthropology at California State University Channel Islands. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology from the University of San Diego and a Master of Arts degree and a PhD in anthropology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Prior to her current position, Dr. Perry taught anthropology and environmental analysis at Pomona College for 10 years. Her research and publications are focused on human environment interactions on the island, including those related to marine ecology, cultural landscapes, and native ceremonialism. Although Dr. Perry has, involved, has been involved with archaeological field work in Mexico, Chile, and throughout Southern California, the majority of her research has been conducted on the Channel Islands, and she has collaborated with Channel Islands National Park since 1998. Her talk tonight will discuss her recent research on prehistoric settlement patterns in the interior of Santa Cruz Island. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Perry. Thanks. Thanks for that nice introduction. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. I'm not used to talking with a microphone. I have a very loud voice. So um, please let me know if I drown it out or you can't hear it. I'll try to be mindful of that. So good evening. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be here on this hot and humid evening. If I pass out, it's because it's too hot. <laughs> but thank you for being here. Thanks for the invitation from the park uh, to be here tonight. Uh, and also, I just want to thank many of my colleagues at Channel Islands National Park. I've worked with the park for a really long time, and I'm really fortunate um, uh, because of that. And one of the people I've worked with for a really long time is actually in the audience. I don't know if she wants me to point her out, but Ann Houston, who um, is the recently retired Chief of Cultural Resources. So I've worked with her for many years, and I'm very honored that you're in the audience tonight. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge somebody who's incredibly important within the archaeology of the Channel Islands. His name is Michael Glassow. Uh, he's been working out on Santa Cruz Island for almost 50 years. Um, yeah, really extraordinary. He's still incredibly active for those of you who know him. Uh, and it's really because of him we have the understanding that we do about the prehistory of the Channel Islands, either directly through his own research or through the training of his students and their students. So I was one of his students, and I'm honored to be his collaborator. And today I'm going to talk about some of the research that we're jointly doing. So um, if you have a chance to ever meet him or hear him speak, I highly recommend it. Uh, we really wouldn't be where we are today without him. So I wanted to start with a question. How many of you been, have been to Santa Cruz Island? Great. That's what I assume, that most people would be knowledgeable about the island. So what I want to talk to you tonight about is the, the archaeology of interior landscapes on the Channel Islands. And so we start with this idea with the idea that the clicker would work. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it just OK? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we start with something we're all very familiar with. The, the California Bight and the Eight Channel Islands are an area of extraordinary environmental variability um, to the point that they're popularly referred to as the Galapagos Islands of the Northern Hemisphere. So a lot of variability within the islands. And one of the reasons for this has to do with the intersection of cold and warm water currents that results in nutrient upwelling within the California Bight. And that is what feeds an extraordinarily abundant and diverse range of marine resources. It's these marine resources that people have been attracted to for thousands of years. And in fact, some of you may know that some of the oldest evidence of people being in North America and the Americas at large comes from the Channel Islands. So this is a place that people were attracted to really early on because of these resources, and they've stayed here for a really long time. So it's one of the areas of continuous occupation for at least 13,000 years. Really amazing. Now, because of this reliance on marine resources, a lot of the archaeology on the Channel Islands is characterized by rich shell middens. And middens are basically just big trash piles that are composed of discarded meals, different tools, and otherwise. So on the Channel Islands, what we see very clearly are thousands of shell middens that are the result of all of these activities. And on the coast, directly on the coast, these can be extraordinarily large and deep. 
And the reason I'm bringing this up now is that most of the archaeological focus of the past century has been on these coastal shell middens. A lot of the work has been done immediately along the beach uh, and not in the interior of the islands. And there's good reason for that. There are these thick shell middens. They have a very deep stratigraphy, meaning you can look at a long time frame in one archaeological site. And as an example of that, I've included a picture of Eel Point on San Clemente Island, where I've had the good fortune to work. And there is an at least 9,000 year record of people living there. So you can learn a lot. You're staring at it right here. Uh, right in here, this is basically nine or about nine, 10,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, present day. Um, so amazing sequence. You can see changes in technologies and all of that. So it makes sense why people or researchers have looked at coastal shell middens in particular. But that means that there's whole areas of the interior of the Channel Islands that haven't been given as much attention. Uh, we haven't looked in great detail yet. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of the interior studies that have been done in the past century. There has been some work over time uh, that has informed current research. And this starts with David Banks Rogers back in the 1920s. He was associated with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, where a lot of great research is done. And he was one of the first to notice that in the interior, there were these fairly large middens uh, that he called villages. So he was the first one to bring attention to there being something in the interior of the islands. This was followed up in the 1950s and 60s by research conducted by Phil Orr. It might be another character you've heard of, also affiliated with the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. And he did look at some interior locations. He was focused on Santa Rosa Island. And he started noticing a pattern, which he called the Highlander phase. And what he saw was there was a whole um, range of sites in the interior that were located on elevated landforms, so on ridge lines. And they were all dating to around the same time frame, within about six to 4,000 years ago. So when you see BP, I just mean before present. So he saw this, this time frame, kind of this unique signature to the interior, and he called this the Highlander phase. Now, since then, there have been a few scholars, including Doug Kennett. He wrote a book on the Channel Islands. It's a book that I would recommend reading if you're interested in the archaeology. Uh, and he was looking at other reasons why people would be spending time in the interior. And he was interested in issues like, what about people's territories? What are they trying to defend in terms of resources? Where would they go if there was conflict? And we do know that there was conflict on the Channel Islands. Now, since then, there hasn't been a lot of work, and especially not on Santa Cruz Island. Uh, but myself and Mike Glassow have been working on these sites to try to fill in some gaps in terms of our understanding of the prehistory um, of the island and the Channel Islands as a whole. So what I want to present to you tonight is some of our findings, just a, a, a short summary of what we've been thinking about. So we started with some very simple questions. Uh, we wanted to know what is the significance of interior landscapes to the Chumash and their ancestors. We asked questions like, what resources influence site placement? So where do people go and why? And the follow-up to that is, why on earth would people spend the time and effort to transport marine resources into the interior? This is the question my students ask as I'm forcing them on a hike up a hill to a shell midden. <laughs> And they say, ah, sweating, why on earth would people do this? Why would they bring Shell to this location? Great question. How about if you answer it, student? So, um, but but that's, a, that's a fair question to pose. Then what routes did people use to travel through interior landscapes or island landscapes? So much focus has been placed on the boats that the Chumash used, and rightfully so. They're fascinating and they're important. Um, so there, but there's this idea or this focus on maritime transportation. But if you're living on an island like Santa Cruz, sometimes it would make more sense to travel by foot. And in fact, most of the population probably spent most of their lives walking. Uh, very few people own boats. Um, and, there's, and so probably during your life, you may or may, may not have been in a boat that many times. And also, there are places that are easier to get to by foot than they are by boat. Uh, so this is a big question of how they're using the island to travel between places and resources. And then finally, to what extent is the Highlander phase that Phil or, or identified on Santa Rosa Island applicable to Santa Cruz Island? Can we see the same kind of pattern? 
So hopefully what you're thinking about is, well, what the heck is an island interior? Been using that term. Uh, we, can, we can define it in a variety of ways. Um, Mike Lassau and I defined it very loosely. Uh, we were really looking at anything that wasn't directly on the coast, um, but we used two variables, distance to the coast and then also elevation. Because as you know, especially on the northern shore of Santa Cruz, it's, it's very rocky, precipitous cliffs. So that can present as much of a boundary as being further into the interior. Uh, so we're looking at this pretty broadly. Um, we were looking at basically a quarter mile in from, from the coast and then also considering elevation. Um, anywhere that you'd really have to make a concerted effort to transport marine resources, which you'd have to do because on the Channel Islands, there are a few terrestrial animals that you could depend upon for protein. So you'd really have to supplement that with shellfish, um, fish, and sea mammals. Now on Santa Cruz, we can say there are true interiors, uh, including the Central Valley, which is bounded by two major ridgelines. It has its own microclimate. So if you want to get more strict about this, we could look at the Central Valley in particular. So I'm going to present to you some general information about what we found across the island, but I'm also going to focus in on two areas, uh, the central valley of the island and also the east end of the island, particularly in the area of the, of the Montagnon Ridgeline, which bisects the island, kind of defines the east end. And you might not be thinking, if you've spent time on the Montagnon, you might not be thinking that's an interior. Um, but try hiking up and down to the very top of it on a daily basis, and it will feel like kind of a distance from the coast. So um, we could, I think that it's fair to assume that or think about that as an interior. Now throughout the islands, we're thinking about environmental variability across the islands. Santa Cruz Island is amazingly environmentally diverse. It has a lot of different regions um, and, and different microhabitats. And so there's a lot of variations that we need to think about in terms of human habitation. And these include things like the geology, the topography, the amount of fresh water available, uh, also what kind of vegetation or plants, access to coastlines, and all these things would influence the distribution and availability of raw materials for making tools, um, things that were used for food, and then also medicine. So that varies across the island, and it's something we had to factor into uh, our studies of these sites. So just to give you a couple of examples of what we had to consider, uh, it includes access to coastal habitats. Um, how easy would it be to get to the coast from that particular location? And what kind of coast is it? Is it rocky intertidal or sandy beach? What kinds of resources would be there? Another variable that's incredibly important, important to all island societies throughout the world, is access to freshwater. Uh, that's probably one of the most important determining factors of where people live and how long they live there. And what I want to point out here is this, this is a watershed ranking map um, that was generated by Doug Kennett. And you can see that all the watersheds are ranked, and this is based on overall flow, an average flow. Um, and one thing to see is that the Central Valley is the highest ranked uh, watershed, and there is permanent water there. So you can always count on run, running water. Um, and, and so this would be an attractive area. The other thing I want to point out is on, on the east end of the island, and this is something to remember for interior occupation, is that there are high rank watersheds there, but in times of drought or arid conditions, that water dries up next to the coast. The place you'd have to go and get it is in the interior, and especially at elevated locations, because that's where the springs and the seeps are at. So uh, in the east, on the east end, if you want to go to reliable water sources, you're going to be hiking uphill somewhere into the interior. And then another resource that's incredibly important to consider is the availability of chert. And chert was an important tool stone um, for the Chumash people. So globally, the two most important um, stones for people are obsidian because it's sharp and chert because it's durable. Chert is the thing you want to use to make drills out of. Anything that requires um, a, a lot of um, force behind it without breaking. So chert's important prehistorically across the world. Uh, on the Channel Islands, it was really important for making a wide range of tools, including knives, spear points, uh, projectile points, drills, drills for making fish hooks and digging stick weights, and drills to make the shell beads that were the currency. So chert's incredibly important. 
And what's interesting across the Channel Islands is that not all islands have chert. Uh, and the most abundant and high quality sources of it come exclusively from the east end of the island. So although we know of chert sources across the Channel Islands, the most abundant sources are on the east end of Santa Cruz. And this is probably one of the really attractive reasons for spending time on the eastern end of the island. Uh, so these are photographs of quarries on the east end of the island. Um, at the top here is an example of what the chert looks like. Uh, this is a chert quarry that still has hammer stones on the surface of it so we can see that they're they're making tools and this is a photograph from one of the largest quarries that we know of very very extensive for scale these are people right here and that's not even the full quarry so so important so with these various factors in mind Mike Lassau and I compiled data that we'd been gathering over several years on different projects and what we did is we realized that we had 42 different sites across the island with radiocarbon dates and then 17 of those we've conducted excavations at. So what we did is compiled all that information and tried to look for patterns across the island. You'll notice that some areas don't have a lot of information. Not a lot of work has been done on the isthmus. And there's sections of the North Ridge, if you've ever spent time there, it's incredibly rugged and tough to get around. So there's been less research there. Uh, but you can see from our data set that we have sites that we're representing all major areas of the island. Uh, and I do think we have some pretty meaningful patterns. So here's what we were looking at in terms of these sites. We looked at some basic characteristics, including how big are these sites? How deep do they go? How dense are the materials? So how, how dense it is in terms of artifacts and faunal materials? How diverse is the range of artifacts and faunal materials there? And then, of course, their proximity to these other desirable resources. So just a few of the variables. And so you can get a lot of ideas about the nature of occupation based on this. So if it's a very small site, not very deep, only one kind of shellfish, it might be the product of a lunch. Um, but if you have a whole range of artifacts, it's deep, it's large, you might be looking at a whole community living there for several months or longer. So that's how we were looking at the, the data. So some general statements about what we saw across all of these sites. We can look at the faunal data. What were people eating? And there's a lot of similarities regardless of where we're looking at. Uh, first of all, the, the showman deposits in the interior tend to be more shallow and smaller than coastal sites, uh, which I think is kind of not surprising. Um, but to just give this some perspective, the majority of interior sites are no deeper than about three feet of deposits. Whereas a coastal midden might be upwards of 6 to 12 feet or deeper. I've, at Eel Point, I've excavated down to 15 feet. Um, so these are not very deep. They're not very dense. And they have a lower diversity of faunal materials than you would see on the coast. So depending on a few key resources, they're not going for the full range of resources you might have access to right on the coast. They're relying a lot on rocky intertidal zones that are very productive in other nearshore habitats, uh, including kelp beds. Um, but the single most important uh, food source in terms of marine species is California mussel. And California mussel is important across um, coastal California and throughout the Channel Islands. And at these sites, it represents between about 75 and in some cases 99% of the shell by weight. So they're eating a lot of, of California mussel. Um, but also, they're depending on sea mammal hunting, they're fishing a lot, especially California sheephead and surf perch, and then also for birds. So those are all present within these middens. And there's a couple of them that have some really interesting um, items, including high status, large marine mammals, like bits of dolphin, swordfish, and other high status meats. Uh, so that's, that gets a little interesting as far as what's going on in the interior. So the image at the top is an example of the site that I excavated in the Central Valley. It gives you an idea of how shallow these deposits are. This is just to give you an idea of the proportions of the kinds of foods you see in these middens. And all I did is simplify this and I gave you an example of two sites on the east end and two sites in the Central Valley. The largest band here, the blue, is California mussel. So part of the take home is that California mussel is important throughout but it looks like there's a little bit of a greater dependence on it in the interior 
And I think part of the reason is it's really easy to harvest. It's very predictable. Anyone can gather it, and it's very easy to transport. Uh, so it's kind of a perfect meal as far as if you're going somewhere away from the coast. Um, but we have a range of other resources, including one of my favorites, which is a subtitle shellfish uh, called wavy top or wavy turban. Uh, and this is also a great meat package in terms of something that you could transport. You can carry it with for two days and still be able to eat it. Um, so it serves a lot of purposes in terms of traveling into the interior. So there's some generalities in terms of what they're eating. Now we're going to look at the artifacts that we've found in these sites. And generally speaking, we see a lot of tool stone. We see a lot of flakes and debitage and cores, other byproducts of making tools. And these are largely out of chert and volcanics. That's the two primary materials. And what they're making include flake stone tools. So I mentioned chert bifaces. That can include knives, spear points, arrowheads. That all falls into that class. Uh, and then also drills and micro drills being really important. But also we found a lot of ground stone, a lot of ground stone tools representing all the major groupings of ground stone, digging stick weights, monos, matadis, mortars, pestles. These are all present in these interior sites. And then also we find a lot of beads and ornaments. So Already we can tell that it's not just a simple short-term habitation, it's not just camping overnight, um, but there's these other elements here that are suggesting that people are spending some time there. Uh, but we have examples of stone, glass, and shell beads. And the two images at the bottom, um, this is on route if you're going from prisoners into the Central Valley, and I included it because in this creek bed there's a lot of volcanic material that you can make tools out of. So you could be shopping for your materials as you're going to your site. Um, and then on this side is, an, uh, is from an excavation in the Central Valley. And this is kind of neat because this is, this is a pestle fragment. And based on what was surrounding it, it was a pestle that was broken during manufacture. So they were making it um, in the interior. Uh, and then they broke it. So exploring this a little bit further in terms of artifacts, again, we found a wide range of ground stone implements. And this is indirect an indirect indication of plant exploitation. You can use stone bowls for a variety of things, but putting this all together, it suggests that people are in the interior to um, harvest certain kinds of plant foods. The one specifically that I think is most meaningful in this regard are digging stick weights or donut stones. Um, and these are all technologies that are used throughout the world. Here's an example of historic um, digging stick weights um, from um, in Chumash collections. And this is showing you how the donut stone is secured to a wooden shaft. And this would be used like a hoe or a shovel um, to dig up roots, uh, corms, and bulbs to eat. So this is a really important staple item. Here's how we see it archaeologically. Rarely do we get the complete specimen, but this did come from the Central Valley. Um, this is made out of serpentine. Um, more often, we get it in this form which is probably that somebody was using their, their, their digging stick and they broke the stone and just left it there. So we usually get half the donut. Uh, I really like this one. Uh, it's made out of sandstone. You can just barely make it out. There's an incised design on it. So somebody put a little bit of embellishment on this tool. Now as far as direct indications of plants, it's been very hard archaeologically to find evidence of plants, but things have been changing recently. There's been a, a new techniques that have been developed to extract um, small botanical remains from the soil and also from the groundstone tools. So this is an exciting prospect. Um, some of my glass owls, recently graduated students, have been focusing on this and have been successful in recovering plants from some of these interior sites. Uh, so this includes carbonized corms uh, translated into these are um, blue dicks or brodea bulbs that have been intentionally burned or cooked uh, to eat. And so this was found in some interior sites towards the west end of the island. So if you're interested in this, this would be a good person to have speak here. In this lecture series is Christina Gill, and uh, she recently completed her dissertation on this very topic. Um, so what we're seeing in terms of other people's research is finding the actual plants to support this idea that people are in the interior or plant foods. And this was really, really important, despite our inability to see this in the past. And going along with this and, and changing this lens, 
uh, in which we thought that plants were not that important on the Channel Islands or less available. Uh, within recent years, we found more evidence of bedrock mortars, and those are usually direct indications of processing plants. So when I first started working on Santa Cruz Island, I didn't know of any bedrock mortars. Since then, we've been finding them in a variety of locations. There was the idea that maybe they weren't using them or making them on the Channel Islands because the geology is just not well suited for that. Um, but it, as you can see here, here's three examples of bedrock mortars from different locations on Santa Cruz Island. They were definitely doing that as well. It's just now we're seeing it archaeologically. So plants. Uh, but I wanted to get back to thinking about chert for a moment. And in addition to ground stone, we have this whole range of flake stone tools. And, and a lot of it is made out of chert. And what we're seeing is that people are making tools and maintaining tools in the interior. So this is partly they're there um, to make the tools in the first place, but they're also returning to their camps and fixing things that had broken or resharpening tools. Um, so one thing that we find a lot of in these interior sites are a kind of biface known as a contracting stem point. Um, this is shown right here. Um, this dates to several thousand years ago, so that's the base of the point. And we also find an association with, with what are called bifacial thinning flakes. So this is where you're thinning, actually thinning the stone um, to make the point. So based on this, it looks like they're making these bifaces or contracting stem points, but also they're going back and retooling them. So what I think is going on is we have a lot of these sites have sea mammal bone in them. And I think that they are, they are hunting sea mammals, sea lions, very common. They're bringing those butchered bits of meat back to their sites. And then what they're doing there is they're resharpening their spear points and then taking those back to the coast. Uh, so we have evidence of that. We also have evidence of a lot of different drills and micro drills, micro cores, micro blades um, that are indicators of making beads in a variety of bead styles. Uh, and this includes the shell bead currency, but also earlier shell bead forms. And also some of these are larger drills that were probably used to make the donut stones or digging stick weights. Uh, so they're making them in the interior. Also what we find at a lot of these interior sites is work deer bone. So you start thinking about that, where is the nearest deer? It's on the mainland. So this is imported material. And it's probably being imported in, as a finished tool. Uh, and what they were using deer bone for, it's very dense, very sturdy. They were probably using it for fishing implements. And then also as awls to either make baskets or to repair baskets and probably nets as well. So this is an kind of interesting um, area of research because we have no or very few examples of baskets from the Channel Islands. So in terms of the role of baskets on the islands, we have to look for the evidence indirectly. And it comes in these forms. Uh, but also this tells us something about the nature of trade relations and the idea that people are getting materials from the mainland and they're bringing them with them into the interior of the island. Also what we have, and this relates to baskets, is um, at a number of these sites we're finding tarring pebbles and clumps of asphaltum, which is the method that they use to seal the inside of baskets to make them waterproof. Uh, so this is how you would make the canteens to store water. So we're finding this at interior locations near water sources, suggesting that they're either making or repairing the baskets that they're using to store the water in. So it says a lot about water storage. Okay, so this requires us to get back to thinking about chert, uh, one of my favorite topics. And, um, and so as I mentioned, the, the most abundant sources of chert are on the east end of the island. Now, I've already said that chert is present in sites across Santa Cruz Island. So this may have required someone to travel 10 or 15 miles by foot to go get the chert that they needed. Either they went for it directly or they traded it or it traded hands um, across the island. But this means that people were making quite a concerted effort to get chert uh, to make some of their tools. So in previous research, I was really interested and how people were interacting with these chert outcrops on the east end of the island. I had wondered about how that influenced site location over time on the east end of the island. And right now we know of 27 different chert outcrops on eastern Santa Cruz that have really clear evidence of people coring there and making tools. So that's a really, that's a tremendous abundance um, of chert coring. And 
if you put all this together, there's at least 10,000 years of a record of exploiting this chert. So long, very long sequence, um, very important. So all the red dots, as you're probably suspecting, are chert quarries that we know about. And, and one thing I want to point out is, although there are some along the coast, some of the best locations in terms of the highest density material is surrounding the Montagnon at higher elevation. So another reason why they're going into the interior is to access this higher quality chert. And interestingly, um, some of these quarries are also right next to some of the most reliable freshwater sources. So you kind of get two things at once. And I really like this example here, going back to this image, because it's showing you hammer stones sitting on the surface of this area where they're testing the quality of the rock. And based on the sizes and dimensions of these hammer stones, they're being used from anything from smashing open the rock to test it to making and refining very tiny tools. So they're doing a lot on the spot. This is a different way of looking at the, these data, and I realize it's a little complicated, but what I was trying to do here was to depict the relationship between quarries and shell middens. So all I want to, to do with this image is to say that there are a number of shell middens located right next to the church quarry, so people are camping out right there uh, to, to do their activities, um, and, and that there are also shell middens nearby. But that, that's really the take home here is that people are very much moving right next to these quarries to do these activities. All right, so if you don't believe me that the East End is the most important area for chert quarrying, you could look at it a different way. Um, so what this is, is it's taking a couple of sites from the East End, from the Central Valley and the West End, and it's looking at the density of flakes and debitage within a unit of soil. So controlling for um, volume. And, and so what you can see here clearly is that on the east end, they're involved in a lot of chert coring, a lot of making of tools. Uh, if you go further to um, the west, the scale of, of making tools is much smaller. So that's, that's really the gist of, of this slide. Now this is a little complicated, but this is the same thing in that we're looking at. Here are east end sites, central valley sites, and west and West End sites, chert is represented in green. The other important one is yellow, and that's volcanics. And what you'll notice is that all of the East End sites, the dominant um, stone material is chert, not surprisingly. But as we move farther away from those chert sources, people are incorporating more locally available tool stone. So you don't need chert for everything. You don't need the highest quality material for everything. Sometimes you just need a rock. Uh, and you're going to use something that's sit sitting right there in the creek bed like volcanic. So we can see uh, this function of distance away from the chert quarries and that people are substituting lower quality materials because they're right there. Something else I wanted to point out, although it's hard to see, is that also what we find in many of these interior sites is obsidian and fused shale. And these also come from the mainland. Um, so it's definitely another indicator of trade and exchange with the mainland. And obsidian, you may know, some of the nearest sources are the Coso Mountains of Eastern California. So things are coming in from far, far away and being incorporated into these interior settlement systems. So that's thinking about the, the east end of the island. And then as I was discussing, as you move farther away, uh, there's, there's a less, a smaller proportion of chert, more volcanics. I want to focus in on the Central Valley for a moment, uh, which is really fascinating, uh, and, and particularly on a cluster of archaeological sites right in this area. So there's a higher density of sites right there than elsewhere in the Central Valley. And this is where I've been focusing some more recent research. So there is a higher density of sites right in the middle of the Central Valley at the confluence of a couple major water sources. Uh, and this is right next to the main ranch. So people like the same areas for some of the same reasons. Um, and in this area, of course, there's reliable fresh water, edible plants. Um, there's, uh, and also, this is a really great way to travel across the island by foot and by car. If you're going to go today from one point to another, you'll inevitably cross through the Central Valley. It is the most logical, so that's another reason. If you put together um, the evidence of excavations in the Central Valley, 
uh, it looks like people have been there for at least 6,000 years. It's probably older. So people are attracted to this, region, this area for a long time. And this continues up to and through Spanish contact. It could be, in fact, one of the last places uh, that the Chumash were spending time on Santa Cruz Island before um, being fully incorporated into mainland life. So I wanted to focus in on something in particular in the Central Valley. So there are a number of sites there that conform to this general pattern that I've been describing, but there are a few sites that stand out. Uh, and this is, um, this is the byproduct of research I've been doing alongside of one of Mike Lassell's other students, Elizabeth Sutton, another fascinating um, topic. Uh, but together we were looking at a couple of sites within the Central Valley that tell somewhat of a different story. They have deposits that date to more recent in time, to the late, not only the late Holocene, so the last 3,000 years, but also up into historic times. We see this based on radiocarbon dates, but also the presence of European glass beads in the interior. And then along with this, something that I'm extremely excited about and I look forward to further excavation is a site that contains this small ashy lens. And we, we excavated just a portion of it. We were very lucky to find it kind of just by happenstance. And what's contained in this ashy lens are a variety of high status items. Um, it's a range of shell beads, but it also includes swordfish, which is a high status food. Um, it, the swordfish was important. Uh, for supernatural reasons, it was important for ceremonialism. So if you see swordfish, there's something going on there. It's very difficult to hunt and catch, as you may know today, if you, if you fish for swordfish, not an easy thing to catch. Um, but when you see that in an archaeological site, it's suggestive of that they're not just barely surviving, that there are probably some important individuals there. But if you put that together with other evidence in this feasting feature, there's also high status cuts of sea lion and other things. And so it suggests something else is going on here. If we couple this with the research that Elizabeth Sutton's been doing, um, we think that these sites together may possibly be a gathering place or a village that's known in the historic documents as Nematlala. And this is really extraordinary because for so long it was thought that all Chumash lived on the coast um, uh, during historic times. Uh, that's all the maps you're going to see, but there was this Nematlala, where is that? Uh, and I think we have compelling evidence for it in the Central Valley. All right, so that, now that relates back to how do we put this all into broader trends that we see across the Northern Channel Islands? How do we understand this? And, and first of all, if we're looking at the body of data that exists out there, a lot of people would agree that over time um, there's a shift from say 5,000 years ago, where people are moving in between interior and coastal locations. They're living um, season to season. They're moving the whole community. And they have kind of a mobile lifestyle, moving to different resources that are seasonally available. Uh, so that's what I mean by the interior coastal emphasis of the middle Holocene. Later on in time, um, starting around about 3,000 years ago, there's a shift. Uh, and people begin to become increasingly oriented towards the marine environment. See an intensification of fishing and of trade. Um, and, and this goes along with the introduction of two major technologies. One are circular shell fish hooks, which make it easier to fish in kelp bed environments. And then also the introduction of the plank canoe, which allows you to hunt on the open ocean uh, and also is extraordinarily um, wonderful for transportation of goods. So these two technologies alone are really important and you can see this shift towards an increasingly maritime lifestyle. So that by, um, by the last thousand years or so, most people are living on the coast in sedentary villages. It's a complete shift in how people are utilizing the islands. Um, and this, these data from the interior support this. Also what we see is an increase in certain kinds of trade and craft specialization, including the production of the shell bead currency. This means that people are increasingly interested in the chert on the east end of the island. Now in addition to technological shifts, we also have to consider the role of climate within this as we're sweating here, thinking about climate change. Um, but certainly, and this is kind of a backdrop, we have to think about periods of drought uh, and other climatic fluctuations as well as conflict really driving where people are living on the landscape. So that's, that's kind of the context that we need to put this in. 
So with that in mind, the other piece of the data that I want to talk about is the chronology. I've given you an idea um, that there's some similarities across the island in terms of people how people are using the interior. There are some variations region by region in terms of the specific resources there. But I think even more exciting is the chronology of these sites. Uh, and what Mike Glassaw and I notice is that there's two major time periods of occupation of the interior. One is between 5000 and 1000 BC. So you can think of that as the middle Holocene, this earlier time frame, this earlier kind of settlement. And then the other time frame is between 8500 and historic times. And in between is a gap. Um, and, and so this, what this image is over here is all of our radiocarbon dates. Don't try to analyze it. It's, um, but what we notice is that there was a gap uh, between about 1000 BC and AD 500, and only four of our sites had deposits dating to that time frame. That's really unusual. 1500 year period, only five sites fall within that. Um, only one site between uh, uh, 500 BC and AD 500. And the other really interesting thing is there's almost no overlap in specific site location between these two periods. There's two sites that are exceptions, but there's no overlap in the specific location which suggests that they're, they're utilizing the landscape in a completely different way. Same resources, but a different settlement system. One of these sites is in the Central Valley. It's the one I described that has the feasting feature. Uh, so the Central Valley is kind of unique within this. So how do we characterize these sites? Well, we can go back to that idea of the Highlander phase that Phil Orr described on Santa Rosa Island. A lot of these sites date to the Middle Holocene. They overlap with the Highlander phase, and they are indeed found at ele on elevated landforms. So in some senses, Orr was right, and you can extend that idea um, to Santa Cruz Island, although there's some important variations that have to do with differences in topography. So earlier on, people are living the, on these elevated landforms, uh, probably very strategically to, to balance out their access to marine resources, plants, chert, Freshwater, it's a central place that you can go and get all these resources from. Later on, in the late Holocene, so the second time frame, they're, they're using this really differently. They're not on the elevated landforms anymore. Instead, a lot of their signature in the interior, they're located right next to chert quarries, and they're also located in rock shelters in the canyons themselves. Very different. So this is a summary of what we see, the middle Holocene pattern of these seasonal residential bases on ridge tops, in contrast to a late Holocene pattern where people are largely living in coastal villages and then making these forays into the interiors. Now they're living on the coast and they're going into the interior, getting what they need and coming back to their coastal location. Uh, so maybe going for chert and then coming back. But we do see some occupation in the interior in the late Holocene. And this could be for a couple of reasons. We're thinking about rock shelters. Um, two reasons that you would be there. One is that a lot of them are near reliable fresh water, so it could be that. And also it might be for defensive purposes. If you need to hide out and you need protection and defense, a rock shelter is one of your options. Uh, so those could be, that speaks to a uh, previous hypothesis that where you see uh, late Holocene signatures in rock shelters, maybe that's one of the reasons why. So this fits into some general hypotheses about how we think people are using the interior. Uh, and so, first of all, most people are probably wanting access to freshwater resources, to toolstone, and to plants. And I think we see these across uh, all these sites. Uh, but then more specifically, we have circumstances in which we see sites that are probably the remnants of meal breaks or stopovers as they're walking across the landscape. You see a tiny patch of shell, it's one kind, it's one meal, it might be a function of that. Uh, also, um, more specific to the late Holocene or recent times, we have rock shelters, maybe for defensive purposes. And then also for talking about the Central Valley, this gets back to that feasting, possible feasting feature. This, the Central Valley may have functioned as a gathering place for people who are living in different coastal communities. So that's all I mean by that. So maybe serving a different function. So getting to the Central Valley, I think it's pretty unique in this regard. We see this general pattern across Santa Cruz Island, but the Central Valley stands out as something really important for some of the reasons cited here. It's everything that you could want. Uh, you know, so no wonder the main ranch is there. 
Um, and I've, I've mentioned some of this already, but we can also think about the diversity of plants contained within the Central Valley. It's not just oaks, but island cherry. There's Islay Canyon right off of the Central Valley. Uh, cattails, cactus, that's all there. Um, some of the plants that are in the Central Valley today have medicinal properties. It's also that. Uh, you have access to local tool stone. Also this idea that you have, um, you have a lot of options in terms of travel routes. And then finally, something I've noticed in working out there, that the Central Valley has its own microclimate. And sometimes when it's extremely stormy on the coast itself, you can get respite in the Central Valley. That's where you're going to get protection. So that could be a factor as well. You could never demonstrate that archaeologically. But certainly that's, that's probably one of the things that's influencing uh, those decisions to go into the interior. So this gets back to the Central, the central Valley, the Central Place. We'll say Central Valley as a gathering place. Um, and it's really fascinating. So I wanted to get back to this idea of travel routes or intersections. And what you'll notice here again is that if you're trying to get to major coastal villages, say if you want to go from Cajas on the north to Cochis Prietas, which is where the village of Leon was located, probably one of the easiest ways is to walk. Be much longer to, to paddle that. And so where you're going to go is the Central Valley. If we look at ethno-historic records, if we look at the Spanish mission records, um, there were marriages between the people of these villages. So they're clearly connected to one another. Cajas was regarded as a major economic port. Liam is a political center. They're intermarried. So it could be that the Central Valley was a, it was a mutual gathering spot where they were spending a lot of time. And perhaps the Matlala is not its own village, but it refers to this central place where they're gathering together. Uh, that remains to be demonstrated, but very, very fascinating about the Central ba Valley being this extremely important place. And that gets to thinking about the very last occupation of the island by the Chumash. Um, the last people to leave the island, according to mission records, were living at Cajas. And it could very well be that some of the things that we're finding in the Central Valley are associated with that very last occupation. So it couldn't be more significant in that regard. So I just wanted to wrap this up. We've kind of done a broad overview of what we're seeing regionally and through time. And, and one thing to take away is that what we are finding in the interior is consistent with some of the ideas that we're getting from the excavation of coastal middens. One of these being this shift over time in terms of settlement and subsistence and this increasing orientation towards a maritime lifestyle. We clearly see a decline in habitation of the interior associated with coastal sedentism. This doesn't seem like a surprise. It's just nice to see it archaeologically. You see these growing large sedentary villages. You see fewer and fewer sites in the interior. What we can also see is an association with the introduction of new technologies. So we have this gap in the chronology. It fits in really nicely with the introduction of the fish hook and the plank canoe. Um, so then you'd have to ask, well, why are they making these new technologies? Climate change may be a factor in that. Um, this is a time of increasing instability in the environment. Uh, so it may be um, that what's more reliable are some of the fish uh, than some of these plant resources. And so, so we can definitely look at that correlation. And then finally, I think hopefully what this highlights is the importance of the interior to people in the past. That whereas 20 years ago, we didn't talk about the interior, we didn't think about plants as being important. I think what this record is showing is that people were using the entirety of the island and that why they were successful was this combination of marine and terrestrial resources. The most complex hunter-gatherer societies that you find throughout the world are in places that have a rich and abundant um, range of marine and terrestrial resources. So I think that's the key. And then finally, it's really through the combination of looking at interior and coastal sites that we can come to a better understanding of the prehistory of the Channel Islands as a whole. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we'd like to open it up for, to question and answer period now. I'd like to ask just one more time that you wait until the microphone reaches you before asking your question. Where's the air conditioner? That's yeah. my question. <laughs> On its way. <laughs> yeah.
Thanks for coming out. It's very informative, that's for sure. Um, you mentioned, uh, if I understood you correctly, that uh, uh, a thousand years ago, fifteen hundred years ago, they started having more intensification of fishing and uh, perhaps boat boat use. Yet uh, the people go back to six thousand years. We even have evidence of thirteen thousand mm -hmm. years of people being there. Uh, if uh, if they didn't have boats, how did they get the islands? Because the islands have you know, have always been separate from the mainland, as we understand it. Is that correct? So That's correct. Maybe I didn't hear it, understand it all, but then maybe you can clarify that a little bit. Of course, yeah. So the question is really about the boat technology, uh, and 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 it's a good question. Um, so clearly, people had boats from the very beginning. There is no scenario where they accidentally drifted on a log or swam there or anything like that. You'd have to have boats. How do we know this? Some of the earliest evidence comes from islands like St. Clemente Island, uh, which no matter when you're looking at prehistorically is minimally a journey of 40 miles from the mainland. So people have boats from the beginning. We don't know what those boats are. None of these boats preserve archaeologically. So we suspect what they might look like really early on. And they may be skin boats um, uh, with, a, with a structure made out of wood or bone. So we don't, we don't know what that is. Clearly they have them. What's significant 1,500 years or 1,500 years ago with the introduction of the plank canoe is that it's more efficient on the open ocean. So whereas before, we certainly have, there's boats. They're using them for all kinds of things. But what makes the plank canoes so unique is their ability to use them to fish on the open ocean, whereas it looks like previous boats, they couldn't do that. And they also store a lot of cargo. So not very fast boats, but they store a lot of cargo. It's estimated that one of the larger plank canoes could hold up to a ton of fish. Yeah, so so it's 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 just a shift in uh, boat technology. That is a whole other talk about the boats themselves. Very interesting. So it's not that they didn't have boats before, but it's something about this technology that allows them to intensify their fishing and also intensify trade. They're workhorse boats. They're the pickup trucks, um, and so that's that's the difference. And hopefully that addresses part of the question anyway. Right. Yeah. So the plank canoe came in about fifteen hundred years ago. Correct. The Correct. plank canoe came in before it near you. And it, so they were using something else prior to that, apparently. Yes. Right? And I wish I wish this was something like uh, in Florida, they have preserved boats at the bottom of lakes. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we have nothing like that. All we have archaeologically are some canoe effigies that show this style. And then you can infer it indirectly. Sometimes um, in some of the, the cemeteries that were excavated 100 years ago, you'd find somebody who was buried uh, with a piece of redwood and maybe an asphalt and plug. And if you put that all together, they were probably a boat owner and their boat was destroyed when they died. And that was a piece of it. So we can see that. Uh, but also a lot of this is based indirectly on uh, you'd need this kind of boat technology to fish for pelagic species like swordfish. So you're actually looking for the presence of swordfish in the middens. And that doesn't really start happening until about 1,500 years ago. What about population? I'm waiting till the, I'm I'm abiding by the microphone rules. Do we know what the populations were in the islands? So that's a, that's a good question, and people always bring that up. What's the population size? Um, it's really hard to determine that archaeologically. So you could have a really dense deposit. How do you how do you know if that was 50 people for one week or 10 people for 50 weeks? It's kind of hard to sort that out. Um, so it's, we don't have a good handle on this really early on, um, but based on the mission records, uh, we can at least get an idea of an estimate around the time of European contact. And this is probably an underestimate, uh, but it's thought that on the northern islands anyway, there are about 1,000 to 2,000 people living out there. Um, and we know this, well, it's really based on the mission records, um, but a place like Cajas, at least based on baptismal records, supported a couple hundred people. Um, and, and so that's all we can really say is maybe about 1,000 to 2,000 people at the time of European contact. If we think about Avalon on Catalina, I believe that's a couple thousand people. Um, so that's actually a pretty dense occupation. It's probably less if you, the farther you go back in time. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are kind of blown away in this era of infinite population expansion. The idea that a landscape supported more people in the past is mind-blowing. Uh, to them. They're very, there are a lot of people who are very surprised to learn about the prehistory, the rich prehistory of the islands. So that's the best answer I can give you at this point. I don't think we could find out more than, more than that. Um, but we can certainly look at variegation across the islands. 
about 15 years, 10 years ago, there was a boat that sailed out of Santa Barbara, I believe, and there were two ladies, at least, on board. They could trace their heritage to the village of Swatzel through the mission records. Yes. I know the Central Valley was really important, but the park is obviously around Scorpion Ranch area. Can you verify, or is Swatzel, the village of Swatzel, was it one of the largest villages, or was the Central Valley actually dominant? Oh, yeah, good question. So this is about the village of Swahol, uh, which was located at Scorpion Anchorage, and that's probably the place a lot of you have gone to. I could have spent the entire evening talking about Scorpion and Swahol. Uh, it's a place that I've looked at quite a bit. Um, just as, as an aside, you can see this change through time. People are up on the landforms around Scorpion, and those sites date to about 6,000 years ago. And then we have occupation all the way through historic times. There was a question about whether Scorpion was the, the home or the site of Swahol. Um, that's been confirmed through a variety of lines of evidence. And the, the, I think this is pretty neat. I, a few people had already kind of shown that, that Scorpion was the home of Swahol. Um, but I asked a linguist what was the meaning of Swahol. Uh, what, um, and she said, it mean, oh, that's easy. It means boat landing place. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so it fits really well. So that's one, of the, well, that's one of the best places to land, to land a boat on the east end of the island. And if you're traveling from the mainland the way that, that the Chumash did from, um, from what is now Wainimi, sleeping place, um, they would, that's one of the first places they could have viably landed. Uh, so even if you were going to, say, a village further to the west uh, on Santa Cruz or to Santa Rosa, you'd probably stop by Swahol. Based on the mission records, if we're looking at baptisms, it was the largest village at the time of, of European contact or, or around then. So absolutely, I think part of the reason for that was how important the church was. Uh, that's my suspicion. So although you have this amazing Central Valley, um, prisoners, amazing area, I think at least in the more recent times, the East End becomes incredibly important because it's providing the church to make the drills, to make the shell bead currency. It's a huge factor. Um, so, so what you heard was, I think, correct in, in so many words. Um, I noticed there was the glass bead, and I was wondering if that was volcanic glass, because it seemed you were still in that area that was very early, earlier than they could have received those things via Spaniards, but maybe I'm wrong. No, no, you're absolutely right. So when I was referring to glass beads, I was referring to European glass trade beads. Uh, and then it was just interesting to see these um, Euro European artifacts in the middle of the island. So yeah, they are, they're not natural glass. Okay, let me make sure you should get something here. Of the 42 uh, sites with radiocarbon dates, you excavated 17. How are those sites selected? Ooh, <laughs> that's a good question. So how did we select the 17 sites? So this wasn't, um, it wasn't like we started out with this project in mind. We actually had, Mike Lasso and I had several different projects and we were asking different questions. So um, one of the projects that uh, contributed to this was my dissertation research uh, on, on Eastern Santa Cruz revolving around the church quarry. So that's work that I did a while ago. Um, and it wasn't until, uh, my Glasshaw and I were talking one day and we said, we have these very different data sets um, that we were looking at for different reasons. Maybe we can put this together. So I wish I could give you an answer that was, we had this amazing research design at the beginning and had carefully selected these 17 sites, but it was actually a, a realization after the fact of a variety of different projects. Uh, but what we were just try trying to do was look at uh, interior sites that that represented a region or represented a time frame or um, just to you know that we thought that we could get meaningful data out of uh, because some of these sites are very shallow or they've been heavily affected by erosion and the consequences of animal grazing so there's only so many so many of them that you could get good information out of uh, one more question here and then we'll have to wrap it up so Yeah, you were showing uh, a midden that was uh, on the beachhead, it looked like. And is it typical for uh, 
sand to keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper in these islands or during storms some of these middens could have been washed away and that was just lucky that one was there or sorry so th that's a question about um the formation processes of archaeological sites and different natural factors that either lead to scouring the site and removing it or adding more sediment or soil to it. Uh, in the case of Eel Point, it, it's actually several different episodes of occupation. People left the site, sand was blown in and capped that occupation. Somebody came back in, then they left then wind, windblown sand came and capped that. So it happens to be a location where it's always getting new, kind of new material, new sand. Uh, there are other places where it's quite the opposite effect. The wind's blowing away the sand or the soil, and what remains are the heaviest things, the shells and the artifacts. Uh, so if you go to a place like San Miguel, which is incredibly windy, you're going to actually see pavement, what I would call a pavement of mussel shells. And that means that most of the soil has been long gone, and maybe thousands of years of occupation have been compressed into this very thin pavement of shell and artifacts. So it depends on the context. It's something that you absolutely have to understand um, before you interpret sites. And a lot of the sites in the interior of Santa Cruz, it's more of a, there's a lot of erosion and a lot of what ends up happening is a compression of occupation. So it might be within a foot, you have a couple of thousand years of occupation. It tends to be that kind of process. Oh, that's a great question. You just have to know something about um, geomorphology and how, how these things function to, to interpret that. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight and give another round of applause to our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Perry here.